Hello, and uh, welcome to this next installment of Special Collections Summer Seminar Series out in Iowa City, Lesbian Feminism in the University of Iowa's hometown. I'm Anna Tunnicliffe, the Processing Librarian at the Iowa Women's Archives. The Iowa Women's Archives is a repository under the Special Collections umbrella here at the University of Iowa that focuses on collecting and preserving the history of Iowa women. We have uh, many collection strengths, including women in politics, women's athletics, black women in Iowa, and Latinas and their families. Today, I'll be focusing on the effect of lesbian feminism in Iowa and in Iowa City on and off campus that can be found in the Iowa Women's Archives collections. The women we're talking about today were out, as in out of the closet, but they were also out in Iowa City making waves. They opened businesses, staged protests, printed feminist publications, and helped to form a network of women's spaces on and off campus that changed the town for the better, and sometimes in ways that we can still see today. Mostly, we'll be focusing on the 1970s and 1980s, since this was a huge period for feminist activism. But we're going to back up a little bit first to the earliest documentation the archives has of an out lesbian in Iowa. Here you can see Joanne Weldon. Weldon was born in 1931 and raised in Ottumwa, Iowa. She attended the University of Iowa in the 1950s. Here you can see her school ID and a photograph of her from around that period. She came out before coming out was really a term people used. She dressed in what friends called a masculine manner and held what were then typically masculine working class jobs, including driving a cab and a bus in Davenport, Iowa. During her adult life, she had two long-term relationships with women and later wrote about her life as a lesbian. But she doesn't seem to be typical. Fast forward to the 1960s and local papers actually covered lesbians in Iowa City at least twice. This example from the Iowa Defender is from the Jill Jack papers. As late as 1969, articles described a mostly closeted, discreet group of about 50 women who had no hangouts outside of the dorms. Some were friends with men in the gay community, and articles also described incidents of harassment and violence that occurred when members of the group did venture out to the bars around campus. The gay rights movement was on the cusp of major change when these articles were printed. The Stonewall riots would occur in June of 1969, and in Iowa City, diverse sexualities were becoming more visible on campus. In 1970, students at the University of Iowa would organize a chapter of the Gay Liberation Front and enter the homecoming parade. Not long before that, a group of women had founded the Iowa City Women's Liberation Front. Before long, they'd split into several groups, or cells, that each focused on a specific issue for women, like access to childcare, women's health, or publications. This Iowa City group also dedicated one cell to gay rights. The Iowa City Women's Liberation Front was an outgrowth of a larger national women's liberation movement, which dates from roughly the 1960s to the 1980s. It was really taking off in the early 70s. So what was this movement about? Well, it's hard to summarize accurately in you know, a couple sentences, but it was what you might call a radical feminist political movement that put the oppression of women at the forefront. It worked on changing standards of beauty, championed abortion rights, and fought for women in the workplace. It wasn't an explicitly lesbian movement, but lesbians were a strong presence within it. If you've heard of the women's liberation movement before, or maybe watched the recent TV show, Mrs. America, you might be aware that there was a political split within the movement over gay rights. Much was made of it when Betty Friedan, a groundbreaking feminist author and co-founder of the National Organization for Women, called lesbians in the group the Lavender Menace. In response, a group of lesbians calling themselves the Lavender Menace formed specifically to protest feminism's exclusion of lesbian issues at the Second Congress to Unite Women in 1970. However, in Iowa City, these divisions were less pronounced. 
In their article, We Couldn't Get Them Printed So We Learned to Print, Ain't I a Woman and the Iowa City Women's Press, Agatha Vines and Julie Enzer wrote, Lesbianism did not create a visible split among feminists. Rather, concern with lesbianism was both present in the earliest organizing and persistent over time, and activists were able to negotiate conflicts to keep feminist organizations intact. One of the places where this ability to coexist and work together for common causes was apparent was the newly founded Women's Center on campus. In the early 1970s, the Iowa City Women's Liberation Front challenged the University of Iowa to do more to tackle sexism within the institution. In 1971, the university responded with a women's center. In 1976, it would move to the former Alumni Records Building, which you can see here. Located in the heart of the university's campus and where it remained for decades. Today it has a new location and is also known as the Women's Resource and Action Center. It's one of the longest running campus women's centers in the country. But back in 1971, the women involved mostly just had big dreams for it. You can see in this notice, they said, sisters, there's a women's center in Iowa City. They hope to have a women's health information center, classes in basic survival skills, self-defense, plumbing, carpentry, auto mechanics, as well as in women's history and socialization, a liberation library, legal information, abortion referrals, besides being a meeting place or just a place for women to be together. You might notice that despite the influence of a women's liberation front that had a gay cell, none of the things they listed had specifically to do with gay rights, but it didn't stay that way for long. Ain't I a Woman was a publication that sprung from the Iowa City Women's Liberation Front's publication cell and at one time used the space in the Women's Resource and Action Center. It was initially run by a collective that included straight and lesbian women, though it evolved into a staff made up of exclusively self-described radical gay women. You can see in this image of an issue that they had taken inspiration from Sojourner Truth's famous speech of the same name, where she described the hypocrisy of a system that insisted white women were delicate and in need of protection while expecting black women to endure pain and suffering. Ain't I a Woman described itself as a Midwest newspaper of women's liberation and had a subscription base that reached well beyond Iowa City. The publication printed news stories from a feminist perspective with a focus on Midwestern activities. For instance, in one issue, they covered the struggles of Mexican-American workers in Davenport, Iowa's Oscar Mayer factory. The paper also made an explicit effort to include content on lesbian issues within its other feminist and news stories, although this coverage didn't dominate its paper. The publication ran from 1970 to 1974 and eventually sourced its printing to the Iowa City Women's Press, a woman-run operation that I'll touch on in a couple of minutes. In 1974, the Women's Resource and Action Center became home base for another publication for the Lesbian Alliance, a university recognized student organization. The Lesbian Alliance supported lesbians on campus through activities and this regular newsletter, Better Homes and Dykes, or BHD. As you can tell from the joking title, a silly take on better homes and gardens, BHD had room in its pages for humor but also had a serious purpose. The first newsletter outlined its mission. We all regardless of class, color, or creed have a common cause and need support from one another against a society that has never been worth identifying with and need a common base that all of us can come to for information, social activities, political activities, and support. BH and D was a central source of information for activities and thought among Iowa City's lesbian community, with room for everything from summer softball schedules to book reviews to ads for woman-owned businesses. It also provided a center for community support. When two women lost their possessions in a fire, BH&D advertised their needs and other women stepped in to help them replace the things they lost. But back to Ain't I a Woman. When the editors of Ain't I a Woman tried to publish photographs of vaginal self-exams and menstrual extraction in 1971, their male printer refused to print it, 
saying that it was pornographic. The women felt that it was educational. The altercation inspired women in Iowa City to found their own print shop. The Iowa City Women's Press opened in 1972 and took over the printing for Ain't I a Woman. Iowa City Women's Press printed well-known lesbian feminist journals like Sinister Wisdom. They also printed books and periodicals like Against the Grain by Dale McCormick, a feminist guide to the traditionally male field of carpentry. They also did some novelty stuff like calendars and this deck of cards, you can see some of them here, for Spinster, a play on the card game Old Maid. This also happens to be one of my favorite things in the archives. The 1970s saw an explosion of women's presses and publishing, along with the establishment of women's bookstores across the country. But the Iowa City Women's Press was still unique. Iowa City Women's Press was a lesbian-owned business and was one of nine all-women print shops in the U.S. in 1978, and the only one in the Midwest. It had a typesetter, a binder, and by the 1980s, a publisher, Ant Loot Book Company, all operating out of Iowa City. Its success was modest compared to large publishing houses, but a pretty big deal in the lesbian feminist printing world, and its reputation even attracted new people to the area. When three lesbians in California wanted to start a quarterly that would reflect the diversity among us by actively soliciting and printing in each issue the work and ideas of lesbians of color, fat lesbians, lesbians over 50 and under 20 years old, physically challenged lesbians, poor and working class lesbians, and lesbians of varying cultural backgrounds, they came to Iowa City. The resulting quarterly, Common Lives, Lesbian Lives, which you can see here, would be printed in Iowa City for several years. Besides the campus-sponsored space at the Women's Resource and Action Center, women at this time were also creating spaces for themselves to socialize and work in that reflected their feminist ideals. These included the Plains Women Bookstore. You can see the t-shirt up there. They started by selling books out of a suitcase in the Women's Resource and Action Center. It opened its first permanent location in 1977. Plains Woman sold women's music, along with books, pamphlets, and newsletters printed in places like the Iowa City Women's Press. It specialized in materials that mainstream booksellers didn't think would sell enough copies to be worth stocking, and in doing so, opened up a world of feminist literature to women in the area. Plains Woman was open to the public and to women of any sexual orientation, but was frequently supported and staffed by lesbian feminists. It ran until about 1985. In the 1970s, there were also women's only spaces where women could get together without worrying about the behavior of men and lesbians could feel more free to be themselves. These spaces included Grace and Rubies, a women's only club that opened in 1975. You can see some of their stationery down here. Grace and Rubies is mentioned in the papers of lesbians held at the Iowa Women's Archives, like the Carla Miller and Jean Bott papers, and was featured in BH&D. Volunteers had come together to get the club up and running, doing everything from painting the walls to cooking the meals. Grace and Rubies charged a small fee for a lifetime membership, making them a private club. They had to do this in order to get around discrimination regulations that would force them to accept male customers. This flouting of the rules didn't impress the city. Grace and Rubies was investigated for discriminatory practices by the Iowa City Attorney's Office and the city's Human Relations Commission. The space didn't stay open for long, though it's not clear how much the investigations had to do with that. Iowa City was without a woman's only space until 1979 when a woman's coffee house opened. But these were only a few of the woman-owned businesses being run and support, supported by the lesbian community in Iowa City. Such spaces flourished in the 1970s and 1980s, to the point where Better Homes and Dykes actually attempted to list them all in a 1981 feature called the Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. Yes, it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek reference to the more traditionally masculine conception of chambers of commerce, but it's also a really useful document listing the spaces that were friendly to lesbians and that they considered important to their community. Along with businesses like Joe's Laundry Service, 
B-Day Plumbers, and the Iowa City Women's Press. It listed feminist community services, like the Rape Victim Advocacy Program and the Emma Goldman Health Clinic for Women, both of which are still in operation in Iowa City, by the way. Lesbian activists in Iowa City changed the landscape by founding and supporting new businesses and organizations, some of which reached out beyond the community. When looking at the individual papers of lesbians held in the Iowa Women's Archives, one can see a breadth of community involvement, and I want to list just a few examples here. Joe Ravenald, who was involved in the Women's Resource and Action Center, collected gay and lesbian periodicals from around the country and also kept the newsletters of the Emma Goldman Clinic for Women. Jill Jack, who headed the Lesbian Alliance from 1978 to 1992, also staffed the Plains Women Bookstore and advocated for the Equal Rights Amendment. Dale McCormick is another good example of a woman whose feminism inspired her to move and shake the world around her. McCormick graduated from the University of Iowa in 1970 and became an editor of Ain't I a Woman. She also became an example for women in the trades. She started an apprenticeship with the International Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners in 1971. And when she faced sexual harassment at her workplace, filed complaints against them in a time when sexual harassment claims were still a relatively new legal concept. In 1975, Dale became the nation's first journey woman carpenter, and then shared some of what she learned by writing and illustrating a book, Against the Grain, a carpentry manual for women, that was printed by the Iowa City Women's Press in 1977. Tess Catalano's involvement in an incredible amount of activities also kept feminism moving forward in Iowa City. She attended the University of Iowa in the early 1980s and was an active part of the community into the 1990s. Catalano was a singer-songwriter who often performed to benefit causes she believed in, and there were many. Catalano protested in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment against apartheid in South Africa and was involved in a local organization the Women Against Racism Committee that hosted workshops and conferences throughout the 1980s. In 1982, she was a part of the organizing committee for Take Back the Night, a march for women's rights to be out at night without fear of harassment or assault. As a part of the committee, Catalano received correspondence from the university and city officials when the event's policy of being for women faced a sex discrimination complaint that threatened their funding from the Student Senate at the university. But Take Back the Night continued. Decades later, when Miranda Welch, an out lesbian from rural Iowa, came to the university, she could participate in a Take Back the Night march there and become involved in the Women's Resource and Action Center. She also entered a town rich with the legacy of feminist activism. Today, whether we're students taking advantage of women's and LGBTQ services on campus, women in the trades or citizens supporting local women-owned businesses, we can look back and know that a lesbian was here helping to pave the way for the Iowa City we know today. Thank you.